All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Dev Empathy Book Club, uh, where we inspire each other to become better developers and better people by building our empathy skills. So today, uh, we'll be going over the first half of the book, People Wear, um, by Tom DeMarco and Timothy Lister, and uh, talking a little bit about some of the discussions we've had leading up to this point, and kind of getting our thoughts uh, on the book. So to kind of just start us off, uh, Ariel, as always, what did you think of the first half of the book? So before I mention that, I'm just going to kind of throw out as a little bit of a teaser. Some of you can probably notice that I'm moving around a lot in ways that don't seem entirely natural. Um, that's because I'm currently at a treadmill desk. Uh, and I'm not going to divulge why that's important right now. Um, and I'll probably actually turn it off uh, right now. But um, just just as a teaser, that's actually going to be very relevant to uh, to the rest of our conversation. And you'll just have to stay tuned and find out why. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, people wear it's it's a really uh, it's really interesting book um, in that it kind of comes halfway between what we just did uh, uh, the red book what is it called I need like a refresher already that's that's really scary uh, radical candor uh, by Kim Scott uh, which which was just published the last last couple of years um, and then of course we we also recently read mythical man month which was uh, from what forty years ago I want to say um, maybe more. <laughs> um, and uh, and then this is this is kind of somewhere uh, right in the middle. Uh, the first edition was published in eighty seven. I believe the second was published in ninety nine. So we're talking about you know it's it can be considered updated uh, as of twenty years ago. And looking at at that shift, that spectrum of ideas over time, uh, I think has been really really interesting. I'm sure uh, that that Justin you have some thoughts on that as well. Um, so it's sort of it's sort of funny how mythical man month like all the ideas are either either have been uh, generally accepted or uh, in some cases have been roundly rejected. Uh, Radical candor is a lot of very, very new ideas, a lot of untested mm -hmm. uh, ground. Um, uh, you know, like I, I literally was just th just yesterday reading an article uh, about one of the suggested management practices in that book um, and how in theory it sounds great and in practice it turned out really badly for this individual. So uh, ideas that are still being actively and hotly debated. And then in the middle you have people wear. So people wear was, was sort of the mythical man month of its time is a sense that I get. Uh, and there's a lot of ideas there that are, uh, I would I would describe them as in programmer culture, much of this is fairly standard. In workplace mm -hmm. culture, in the actual you know, corporate world, it's really not. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 a lot of the the, the discussions that, that are on the pages might well have been ripped out off of my Twitter feed from today. Uh, and it's really interesting to see kind of the um, you know, the, the, the fact that you have now 20 years of people developing very strong feelings and strong opinions about these things. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and then seeing the, the ideas that, that encounter a lot of resistance from management. Um, and, you know, I used to think that, well, you know, open workspaces are just like this new thing that, you know, everyone keeps complaining about the last few years. And like, you know, it's just, it's just like a fad from the last few years, uh, you know, me being obviously, you know, kind of on the younger side. And, uh, and then I opened up people where, and it, complains about exactly the same things. And this is 20 <laughs> years ago. And I think it's in one of the essays that was written in you know 10 years. So it's literally before I was born, people were having these discussions <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and getting angry about it and, and no one's done anything. Um, you know, not, not it's again, it's not for lack of trying. It's not for lack of bringing up the conversation. Um, it's, it's just a matter of th there are some myths around, around a lot of these issues that have built up over time and have become deeply entrenched. Um, and are a little bit hard to uh, to take out of their place. So I know that was a lot of uh, abstract stuff, and uh, I don't want to again. I don't want to like get into details because that's what we have the rest of the conversation for. Um, but uh, that that's sort of my my broad reflection on the book. And of course, we'll get into a lot of details as we go. Yeah, uh, just to kind of echo in your thoughts, I kind of feel the exact same way. Like I found it humorous, like walking through this book and be like, like, wow, it's so wild to see how. I and my career have experienced so many of these things because it's like, unlike Mythical Man and Month where things have kind of been assumed knowledge, these things are things I think everyone has heard of. I, I, at least in the first half, I didn't come up to an idea. I'm like, oh, this is completely novel to me. It might've been presented in a novel way, but as far as like new, brand new ideas, it was, okay, this is a thing I've generally been aware of, but it's not like it's everywhere. You're like, I, I feel like every chapter I could, point to the startup that I have friends that work at that do this wrong and that they know that they're doing it wrong, but they don't change it. And it's just like, Oh, that's really interesting to see this kind of like middle ground of 
I have the exact same feeling with the open offices because open offices have been the bane of developers since like I started my career like a decade ago, but they're even older than that. Like it started like early nineties as a cool hip thing. And now it's just kind of everything does that, you know, they showed the layout. There's one page where they showed like the layout of the office. And I'm like looking around, I'm like, that's like this exact, that's exactly where my co-working space is. <laughs> it's like that, you know, you got the one corridor on the outside and then the bathrooms in the very center. And then everyone has to just keep walking around. Um, the only difference is here we have walls, so it's a little more private, but it's the same general idea. Well, great. Um, I think we, we kind of are on the same page as far as like the high level um, of the book. Um, we can kind of jump into uh, talk about some of the specifics. Um, before I throw it to you, Ariel, I kind of wanted to touch on uh, the seven uh, false hopes of software management. Um, this one kind of jumped out to me, and I thought we could just kind of quickly run through them. We don't want to spend too long at any one point, but... Uh, Basically, uh, this is very early on in the book. They talk about these kind of like myths, like things that come up time and time again in software management practices about you know how we could better run things. And I have literally seen all of these. <laughs> um, so it was really great they kind of set these up and then kind of you know address the myths directly. And I think a lot of these actually just are true of programmers. Like not all of these are things I've heard from managers and I hear, I see a lot of these from clients, but also a lot of these are things that I just see other developers make these same mistakes. Um, so the first one is uh, there's some new trick that will send productivity soaring. I see this one with clients a lot. It's a very classic manager thing. They feel like, oh, if we just switch to Kanban instead of Scrum, then all of a sudden all the problems would dissolve and we would just get to the end, you know? And that was actually a funny one to me, this, that first one, because it, it, it was kind of a holdover from the mythical man month. And it's sort mm -hmm. of a, a uh, just, just kind of a testament to, to, in respect to this particular false hope, you know, not much changes over time. Um, you know, there was, there was the, the no silver bullet essay, which, uh, which we actually didn't discuss uh, in this, uh, in this framework, but um, essentially the idea that there is no individual trick that's going to send productivity you know, soaring. I mean, the, the no solar bullet idea is there's no thing that will make you have an order of magnitude uh, increase in productivity within 10 years. Um, so it's it's kind of the, the same idea, but a little bit of a different way of phrasing it. And it's so incredibly common. And the bottom line is you need a lot of little improvements that are going to make incremental uh, changes in your performance. And that's what's going to actually, you know, change things in a, in a significant way. Um, and it's it's sort of, I don't want to get too deep into this because now you want to get to the rest of them. Uh, I just want to throw out that I have uh, I saw um, from the, the the people behind uh, behind Ember, I think I've seen this both from from Uta Katz and Tom Dale, that uh, the, the, the reason that Ember has improved steadily in performance over time is not because of, they have some big magic trick that they did that made it amazing. It was just that they had a lot of very small uh, improvements and accruing all those improvements over time has has made performance a lot better. Yeah, no, completely agree. I think in general, this the reason why this is so per pervasive is it's kind of a quirk of human nature. Like I think in general, like it's just a human psychological thing in every vertical and every field. People, I mean, it's why it's clickbait. Like, oh, one hot trick to get you this blah blah blah. It's like that's just a thing people like. They want to know what is the one thing they can do to make a huge difference. So it's pretty natural to assume, oh, that must exist in this problem. If we could just swap out this one thing, everything would be solved because we want easy solutions. Um, and it's always hard to swallow that pill of there aren't easy solutions. <laughs> um, so yeah, mo moving moving along from that. Uh, the, and I'll, I'll kind of glaze over this one really quick, unless you have something to say, Ariel, is uh, the other managers are gaining, are getting gains of 100, 200% or more. Like this is a classic, like why, why are they doing so much better than us? This happens a lot, like in big companies. But I also see this happen with startups, where startups compare themselves to the one next door, or people say, well, Facebook's able to do whatever. And, you know, they're losing the sight of like different teams, different goals, different deadlines, different constraints. Like you cannot just, even in the same company, you're not having apples to apples when you make these comparisons. Um, and it just kind of, I think it's, it's what's the word I'm looking for? It's conflating the issue to just point at some productivity measurement and say theirs is better than ours, you know? Um, this one that was interesting. Uh, the technology is moving so swiftly you're being passed by. I don't see this one as much in management. Um, I have seen this come up a few times with clients, like when they're concerned. I've had, I've had clients this year be like, are you sure we should do this in Rails? Because 
and they're like, oh, but Rails is old. That's what I was heard when I did a Google search, you know, <laughs> like, and they're concerned that, you know, they're tying their new hotness to a sinking ship or something, and they want to make sure that that's not a bad thing for them to do. Um, but I definitely see this with developers. I see with developers who um, are like, have like almost existential dread over, over only knowing whatever thing, you know, this is kind of related to the next one we'll talk about, but it's like, they want, they feel like they don't want to get left behind, you know, um, definitely true of the JavaScript world. Do you have any thoughts on this one? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think anything that you, that you didn't say, it's just, it is just kind of funny to watch the way that, you know, I, I really think this is more of a developer problem um, mm -hmm. than the management problem. And maybe that, maybe that is a change, but it, it's sort of interesting to see people who, you know, who kind of like cry the death of, of this thing or that thing. And, you know, like there are still perfectly functional systems written in COBOL um, that are, that are the, the basis of the, of the financial world. Um, you know, yes, you might, again, I think it really sort of draws back on that first issue, which is thinking that there's some new trick and what trick is it? Well, maybe it's, it's a particular technology and it doesn't mean that new technologies might not be better. Like, yes, yeah, sure. New technologies are created for a reason. They, they are created because someone thinks that it's going to be a better solution to a current problem. Um, but to blame your, your failures on technology is just usually putting the blame in the wrong place. There are very few instances where it's true, but I think it was very telling how in the first chapter of the book, they said that they did a study of 600 failed projects, um, which is, you know, that's a pretty good number. Yeah. Um, and, and there was no case where it was really down to the technology or technology choices. Um, it, it all comes down to people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. it's, and it's easy. It's easier to place the blame on the, on the technology because that's easier to switch out. It's a lot harder to, to place the blame on company culture, even if that really is what's behind it. Because like, oh, well, how do you change culture? That's like a big, you know, ball of wax. And how do I, you know, handle all these variables? But uh, that that's much more often where it's going to be. Yeah. In, in the end, it's people, which is why I love the title of this book. <laughs> um, so the next one was... Uh, changing langu uh, languages will give you huge gains. Uh, and I think this one is directly the wheelhouse of programmers who are like, no, the problem is Ruby, or the problem is Java. You know, this is true. Like Ruby developers, a lot of them in the old days were all Java developers who were like, hey, the problem is Java. If we wrote this in Ruby, we wouldn't have problems. Then decade later, they're like, if we wrote this in Go microservices, we clearly wouldn't have problems anymore. And what they're realizing is actually greenfield projects have the assumed like they appear to be highly productive because you're like reinventing the wheel but as soon as you have to get to like the, the like long haul of the project things slow down again either because of code either because of like code quality or just because large systems take longer like there's just no way around that and management hasn't really been put up to speed with that so then they it's so easy for i think for managers to fall into that same boat of like well maybe it's our language maybe that's the problem <laughs> maybe we should rewrite this you know um, so I kind of think of this one and the last one tied together. And I think it goes back to this idea of like, everyone has their own level, I think culturally at a company, but also individually of like, what's an acceptable level of speed when it comes to like adopting new things and everyone going faster than you is like a maniac and everyone going slower than you is just a dinosaur and they just don't understand technology. You know, like it's funny to have seen that when I came to the Rails community and like the Rails 2 era, of people making fun of Java and C Sharp developers, but now those people are the ones who are like, I'm not moving to a new language. This is perfect. You know, and they're on the flip side of that same coin. <laughs> and, you know, for me, it's like uh Webpack 4 came out like last week. By the time this is out, it's probably way back five now. And people were opening issues on like related plugins like the day after, complaining, like, oh, is this package dead? It hasn't been updated for Webpack 4 yet. It's like it's been two days. It hasn't. It hasn't been like a year. It's just like like people have jobs they have to do. Um, yeah, and I could. I think that's all tied together. It's all this idea of we could get more productivity out of it if we were just always on the most recent thing, whatever it is, whatever cost it is to get there. Yeah, I can offer some perspective on this. Uh, just 
you know, being part of a company where, uh, you know, without, hopefully without divulging too many state secrets, um, but I, I've seen a lot of rewrites. Uh, it's sort of like a thing that the company has decided not to do anymore because they, because it, it's always worked out so terribly, um, um, which I mean, doesn't mean you don't ever rewrite, but it, what it means is, is treat it with a lot of caution and evaluate it as you go and make sure you have a clear vision because, uh, you know, there's there's like one of our products has has a, a history of being rewritten because the person who was in charge of it was constantly coming to this fallacy of oh the technology has to has to move forward you have to try the latest new thing and that's going to solve all your problems and so you know you end, we end we end up with a stack of like 12 different php frameworks powering different parts of the same site <laughs> I might be exaggerating a bit in terms of the number, but it's it's really something ridiculous. You know, I remember when I when I saw the uh, the, the, the diagram of, of how of how that particular site or, or product worked, my, my jaw just dropped. Like, how how do you have so many things that are doing the same job? Like, how is that a thing? <laughs> but it was. Um, and you know, I, I also worked on a big rewrite project from uh, from PHP to Ruby, and uh, of course, you know, the the end of it is that we now have a PHP app and a Ruby app. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, and migration is slow, and like, whatever. But um, but you know, there have absolutely been gains, and and the only you know, the, the the real the real issue that I think was was not you know this particular belief that languages will give you gains, but a that'll give you huge gains uh, mm -hmm. rather than marginal gains, and you know, so evaluating the the cost benefit there, mm -hmm. um, as well as if you don't have a clear vision of of what those gains are going to be and how you're going to get there. All you've done is now, you know, translated your application at best, right? At worst, you've you've you know created a, now a, a broken thing, um, but uh, you know, but that's not really all that valuable. What you really want is is the freedom to you know to to work in a more effective way in the future. So you have to have a very clear vision of how this this change is actually going to get you there, uh, and I think that's often what's lacking in a lot of these projects. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, in most cases, especially in the web world where we work. The languages you're looking at swapping out for aren't a 10 to 1 improvement. Like they're marginal. Like I have done an Elixir project for a client. I really enjoy Elixir and Phoenix, but I wouldn't rewrite a Rails app in it because it's not going to give you a 10x improvement on productivity if that's really what you're going for. I mean, it might be fun. There might be other reasons why you would consider doing it, but not because, oh, Rails is the problem. <laughs> Um, that tends to be a misguided approach um, to solving these things. But we could talk about that all day, so we'll move on. Um, <laughs> so the next one is, uh, because of the backlog, you need to double productivity immediately. Um, I can I can feel this one because I've worked on projects where the backlog keeps piling up and you just, you feel it. Like there's a tangible effect on everyone on the team of like, oh, we need to get through this. Um, and there's it's hard it's like again it's like it's it's psychology more than anything else it's like you have to gear the expectations of everyone on the team you have to make them understand like things just take time you know i'm working on a project for a big you know gigantic corporation uh their internal infrastructure is like eight maybe ten like microservices they're all talking to each other everything is uh code covered test tested out uh, up and down forward and backwards and i feel like we're very productive it's like all things considered, and I was brought on to help them with this giant backlog. They're, they were like, okay, we need some more people just to kind of help uh, churn through it, and I'm helping them, but it just still just takes a while. You know, <laughs> like I'm showing it, I'm like, this is just the time it's gonna take. When you have something this big and you have to touch five microservices to make an update, you know, it's gonna have to take you a couple days to get anything which seems, you know, relatively small actually done correctly. Um, yeah, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean the 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 big backlog issue is of course you know itself usually symptomatic of a larger problem, um, mm -hmm. and usually you know because we're we're so oriented to to do lists and task lists that we basically think oh everything is there is there you know, everything that's there on that backlog is there for a reason, and it's important and so we have to get to it, um, and very often that's not really true if you kind of take the issues one by one and and go through them you can often pull out a lot of things as you know. We're just not going to do this, or it's not the most important thing to do. And maybe we'll get to it, maybe we won't. But it's not something that we really have to be desperate about about getting to. Um, you know, it's it's also often symptomatic of of other issues like uh, very very long feedback cycles. So if you have, let's say, uh, you know, let's say I have uh, a continuously deploying app 
that you know that's that's consumer facing. You know, every time I make a I make a change, I can immediately see if that was valuable and if it's something that's creating problems or damage, I can reevaluate my whole direction. And I don't have to wait a long time to do that. Um, and so if I have kind of like a sense of I want to I want to I want to build like this part of the product, I can build a very small part of it, see if it's good and then say, OK, let's actually now do the rest of it. Um, if you have very long feedback cycles, you basically have to build a complete product, ship it out there and then, you know, and then say, OK, so for this now quarterly release, did people pick up on this or not? Which means that now your backlog and your deadline suddenly become very, very pressing. Um, so, so I would say that the that the long backlog is inevitable in that situation because mm -hmm. you know you you always you know budget uh, more more work than than is actually going to be uh, than is actually going going to get done. Um, there's there's some law of that, which uh, I'm forgetting the name now, but you know, that 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 the work that the 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 work will will always be you know will always have more time or will always take more time than you expected to even when you take this law into account. Um, and you know, and that's that's normal. So uh, you know, but but it it doesn't it doesn't have to be that way. If you have the ability to to slice whole sections of your backlog off, your, or your your theoretical backlog, just based on sending something out there, trying it out, seeing if it works, and then deciding whether to pursue that you know that goal or not, um, because it lets you build much much smaller things, and then uh, and then decide you know is it is it really worth having all those backlog items. Yeah, yeah I think a huge amount of time. Yeah, I think back, backlog pruning is something that needs to be part of like everyone's development cycle at some point. Some the client, the stakeholder, and the project manager need to go through and go okay, go through all of the um, It helps get a lot of the spirit and a lot of the craft. You know, if things that things build up, but they don't need to be there, that can help everyone feel like a sigh of relief. <laughs> to just to get everything organized and just seeing this giant task list just build up. Um, so we'll quickly go over these these last two. Um, number six was if you automate everything else, why don't you automate your software development staff? This one, I, I don't know. This one I feel like I see less than I used to. I feel like I used to, this was a big fear I think in the late 90s, early 2000s that doesn't, has, doesn't really come to pass in the way I think people thought it was going to. Um, so the, the general idea here is People make your software, and one of the biggest like values a, a developer has is they are translating, you know, user requirements, acceptance criteria into code, and they're there to be the translation between what the you know the software you're trying to build and what the computer's saying, you know, conveying the constraints, and that's a very personal, people-centric task. There's a lot of communication involved. This is what I used to try to teach my students as a code school instructor was like. You're not only your code. You are, as a full person, how do you work on a team? Um, and I think more companies than not have realized that, but a lot of companies didn't realize that until after they had tried this, where they said, oh, we can just use faceless automatons to build all of our stuff and never think about it. Um, and it just does not produce quality software or help the lives of any of those people on either side. I think I think that one interesting case study in this regard is the language prologue. Um, so the idea of prologue is basically that you you describe the problem that you have and the language solves it for you. So you basically give it a whole bunch of rules, like you know, the, like there's the whatever it's called, the eight queens problem. You know, like put eight queens on a chessboard in a way that none of them are able to attack each other. So you describe all the rules of how how queens work and how a chessboard works, and then it gives you how many combinations there are. Um, it turns out that it's a really interesting idea and there are very few problems for which it is well suited. And the reason that that's true is because most of what we do on a daily basis as programmers is not solving logic problems. It's understanding, uh, it's understanding people's requirements. It's making things look nice, making usable interfaces, um, just, you know, solving problems for people. Um, and uh, and and that's not something that you can really automate because it, it it's it's a matter of human understanding. Uh, this is this is kind of like this. I, I saw one of these coder comics, you know, a, a while back. Um, sort of like someone talking about how one day we're going to have machines that are so brilliant that you just tell it what you want and it'll just make it for you. And uh, and a programmer responds, "Oh, that's what we do today. It's called programming. You know, you you write your code, which is just kind of a very concise way of saying what you want the computer to do for you." And then it does it. It's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and and that's like 
something that you know that it's not it's you're right that it's not so common today but every so often you see that in like some kind of stupid news article um about you know the future of of, of programming and how there won't be need for programmers anymore because uh, you know your jobs are going to be automated away too and like it's ridiculous because our job is not you know is not churning out code from specification any sufficiently detailed specification can be executed by a computer given a sufficiently high level language um mm -hmm. and the reason that we don't that, that that's not how things work is because we the, the, it turns out that you actually need a lot of details in your specification to the point that the code is a specification. Yeah. Uh, every once in a while, I will. I'll see some, you know, something on a product hunt or TechCrunch, which is like, oh, this new platform for this startup that's in stealth will eventually remove the need for like iOS developers. And it's like, really? And then you find out like a year and a half later, oh, they built like a GUI that lets you click and then plug in some APIs and then you end up with an app. It's like, that doesn't. <laughs> it's mostly like they're, they're finding a use case that they can automate and then they're automating that use case. And I, I mean, it's an abstraction. And really what really what people are talking about in those cases, unless they're talking about like the AI apocalypse, they're talking about like literal, okay, there's a level of abstraction. Like the kind of code we write today, you know, someone 60 years ago, their mind would be completely blown that like, oh, you don't have to write your own, you know, file system for every app. It's like, no, we just focus on, you know, these apps and like, the kind of clients I work with today, you know, they talk about how like there's no way they could have had this built in the 80s. You know, it would have taken 30 developers and millions and millions of dollars to get anything off the ground. And it's like, yeah. So in, in a sense, like that was automated, but not in the way that this is saying. This is saying like, oh, just outsource it. Not even outsourcing, but like just remove it entirely. It's not needed. You know, I mean, that's just not a it's not a thing that really happens. Um, and it's it better to focus on the people than it is to focus on, you know, software developers as some fictional cost center. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that and that's that's sort of what we're doing here, right? Like basically in the long term we can automate all the things that are that are machine oriented, but we can't automate the, the human interactions. And yeah. what that means is that yeah, so software developers aren't going to be, you know, automated out of a job, but what we will be as languages get better and better and higher and higher level is we're we're going to be pe people who talk to people and understand other people, and and empathy is going to actually become the skill. Uh, hopefully, the industry will recognize it too, <laughs> um, rather than focusing on you know reversing a red black tree or you know one of these whatever. I don't even know if that made sense honestly because I never learned how to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know that that's that's hopefully you know we'll get away from that and and into like you know interviews where it's about you know. Here is here is a product person. I want you to sit with them for half an hour, talk to them, understand what they need. Um, you know, maybe speak to a theoretical user, and then you know, and then you can actually turn out a code solution and uh, and and go from there. Um, but that's gonna that's just gonna be our jobs eventually. Yeah, it I... theoretically should be you know at this point because <laughs> we're we're pretty close to there. Yeah, we're we're almost there. It's just getting more. It's just slowly moving more in that direction. Um, and then this last one was <laughs> your people work better if you put them under a lot of pressure. I have definitely worked in these environments where managers believe for one reason or another that you know pressure breeds diamonds or whatever. You know what I mean? Like we just need to push people, you know, light a fire under them to get them to do their work. And I have seen anecdotally, I've seen this work from a perspective. But I've also seen what the consequences of it are, and I don't think it's worth it. Um, and we can have a larger discussion that we don't have to have right now about this, because as a manager right now, as an owner of a company with employees, I do find myself thinking, like, what can I do to make sure people stay motivated? I don't have anyone slacking off. Everyone's working really hard. But it's like, I wish I knew if I, a lever that could, OK, this gives them 10% more motivation to be more productive. and Because there is a level of. Uh, a, a certain level of, of stress slash pressure that allows people to grow faster. Like they do better, they perform better, but it can't be artificial. You can't, it can't be you as the manager pressuring them to do a better job. Um, I had a, uh, I have a friend who had a, a internship at a company and one week during the, uh, during the internship, uh, they were told, okay, so I need you to work on this like sample app that we've been working on and you get this feature done. Uh, if you don't get it done by Friday, you're fired. And they worked all night, like every night, getting it working. They come Friday, they didn't get it finished. They basically almost cried in front of their like manager, telling them, I'm so sorry, I tried my best. And they said, oh, well, you did great, thank you. And they, they had never intended to fire them. They just said it 
to get to see how motivated they would be. And they passed, quote unquote, by working all night for the whole week. And they told them, oh, don't ever work that hard again. But like that person talks about that six years later. Like they are a senior developer and they are scarred by it. <laughs> it's like, that's not what you want to do to people. Like that is horrible. Um, so, you know, I think we have to be more, we have to, we have to spend more time investing in the ways that make people more productive and make people um, work better and harder on our teams that don't have these repercussions. You know, it's not worth doing that to people. You know, it reminds me of one of the anecdotes in the book where, um, where there was a, a manager who, you know, in, in, by some miracle was actually uh, slated to finish the project by the deadline. And so, uh, so she mentioned, she mentioned this top of management and the next day she was told, Oh, we've moved up your, your deadline by three months, because if you're going to finish it at, you know, at the deadline, well, we're just going to apply more pressure. So you'll finish before the deadline. <laughs> so, um, you know, and like, th this is, this is not a way to reward good management. Certainly it's, it's not a way to, to reward the kind of behavior that, that you'd like from individual contributors either. Um, because what it means is if, if you're constantly putting them in that pressure cooker, you know, that you know, when there's a lot of pressure on you, right, you're you're pushing back against it, right? That's that's kind of how pressure works. It's a two-way street, um, and and so just the natural thing is going to be to figure out how to you know how to push against it. Um, definitely, you know, influences turnover and 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 other kinds of very you know, it, there's a lot of expensive repercussions to it. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. <laughs> It's definitely interesting. It's an interesting issue that I don't think is entirely solved, but I think it's good that people realize like, okay, maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, I worked with a client um, that had got government grants and um, they talked about this is like a, I think it's probably an apocryphal story, but they like to tell the story about how it was able to finish their entire project on half the budget. And then they went back for the same budget next year and they didn't give it to them. They said, oh, well, you finished it in half with half the budget. So you get half as much next year. Um, and it's like apocryphal story, but that's kind of true. So like in most cases, if you work at a, like a college or a, uh, or a government institution that takes a amount of funds, if you don't spend all of your money, you don't get it next time. So it encourages this weird level of spending where it's like, okay, we have a ton of money to blow and now we have none, <laughs> you know, until the next yeah. round happens. That happens a lot with startups too, unfortunately, that, you know, the VCs put in money and then you have to spend it because otherwise the VCs will be like, why did we give you all this money? You know, you're you're not you're not doing anything, and so they'll they'll buy like you know instead of buying the three hundred dollar chair, they'll buy the three thousand dollar chair uh, for all their their employees because they have to burn the money because burning the money is somehow has somehow become valuable. Yeah. Um, speaking of valuable, so Ariel, tell me about this idea of Spanish versus English theories of value from the book. Yeah, this is this is. Uh... <laughs> Something that that really spoke to me. So the the book describes these these two. I, I I googled it a bit. I tried to find is is this something that exists outside the book? Unfortunately, a lot of the a lot of things the book talks about it, it kind of has all these inside jokes, and so you're never really sure what's a general world concept and what's just a people wear concept. Um, so it seems to be like a reflection of some idea that was actually out there, but um, but not uh, not necessarily called this. Um, so the the idea is that once upon a time, uh, Spain and England had different ideas of how value works. So Spain thought there is a fixed amount of value in the world and we have to go get as much of it as we can for ourselves. And the English in, thought instead of that, well, we can create new value through ingenuity and technology. So Spain went and uh, you know conquered lots of places in, in the new world and, and sent a lot of gold back to Spain, which of course resulted in, in massive, uh, massive deflation in the value of gold. <laughs> so you know, good job Spain there, um, and and the the British had the Industrial Revolution because they were invent, busy inventing new things. Um, so uh, you know, we we you can look at the progression of history and how Spain was once very powerful and had a massive empire, and over time, uh, England did a whole lot better. You know, the sun never sets on the British Empire, and there's a reason that you know that Australia and uh, and and the U.S. and England are all English speaking countries. Mm -hmm. um, it comes, it comes from England. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so the, the, the basic idea here again is, is, you know, are we going to try to squeeze as much value as we can out of like the stuff that we have, or are we going to encourage creative ways of amplifying the value of, of what we, what we have? Um, so in, you know, in a kind of a concrete, um, 
workplace environment, the Spanish theory of value, the way the authors describe it, uh, is applied by taking workers and making them work lots of unpaid overtime and trying to get extra, you know, nights and weekends and you know extra hours out of them, um, which of course. You know, kind of one of the one of the working assumptions of the book is that overtime is always paid for in some other way, right? You, you're tired the next day, you lose morale. Uh, eventually, you get to the point of of turnover of employees, uh, which is of course a very very expensive endeavor. Um, so, you know, ultimately, you kind of shoot yourself in the foot by by you know having these these minimal gains of an extra hour here, an extra hour there, that that are ultimately paid for you know ten times over, uh, or or I guess you, they're, they're extracted from you, you know, ten times over in other losses, uh, and then. An English theory of value might be more about saying, okay, we have a certain number of hours in the day. How can we make them as productive as possible? How can we give our employees a more productive environment? How can we amplify the value of our employees by training them, uh, by giving giving them opportunities for learning and professional growth? Um, you know, that that would be more of a of an English theory of value approach to use ingenuity to use the technology to make our people more powerful and more productive. Yeah, I I thought I thought that was uh, a fun little uh, thought experiment to kind of look at that and then think of uh, companies that I know of and, and try to see where do they fit between in this. I mean, in some cases, it's more of a spectrum, but I do think there are companies that are very clearly in one camp or the other. Um, and I like this idea of not thinking, and this is kind of going back to Mythical Man Month in some ways, of thinking of every hour from a developer as some interchangeable you know, unit that you can keep track of and that Sometimes working less is better. I mean, one of the things I noticed in myself as I quote unquote became more of a senior developer um, was the amount of times I don't work on a problem. Like I will find a hard problem and say, that is tricky. I'm not going to touch it. I'm going to literally like do something else and circle the problem. And I'm going to like give myself a day to not even approach it and then come back and have a more fully formed solution. So as far as hours are concerned, I spent less hours working on it. I didn't work overnight and I feel like I came up with a better solution because I was able to apply more of a process to coming up with an answer versus saying, okay, this is hard. I'm gonna have to work on this start, <laughs> like like a, like a at the finish line, just go and just go and go and go and just keep writing until I get some sort of solution and that, uh, just isn't true. And I think that applies to organizations as well, where it's like, okay, instead of just treating every single employee as how many hours are they getting in, think about how can we maximize their own productivity in a way that benefits them as a person? Because I think that's how you almost get dividends on the other side. You know, I totally believe in um, working overtime has very, very quick diminishing returns. Like, basically, there's none. <laughs> like, there's almost no diminishing returns. I can understand when, like, you have a really tight deadline on a Monday. There's just no use in not in, in it not being finished, like an actual deadline. We had a client recently needed software launched for the Olympics. If we missed the Olympics, it doesn't matter. The entire project was not worth it. So that meant leading up into it, we were just cutting features left and right. That's not going to get in. That's not getting in. And it meant we all um, stayed up pretty late on Friday trying to get it deployed because we just needed to make sure it was up for the weekend. We weren't working all weekend. And we all... We all went out to lunch on Monday and went home. <laughs> We're like, we need to recoup for all the extra time we spent over the weekend working on this because uh, it's just gonna it's gonna hurt the rest of our projects all week if we go into it with this mindset. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think important to think about that when you're when you're leading a team as well. One other area where I think this has a lot to say is in terms of of pairing or or mobbing. Um, it, it's sort of funny to me that there's this, you know, this, this, like this old conversation about, you know, is pairing worthwhile, right? Cause you know, the, the, the sacred developer hour, you know, you're, you're only getting, getting one unit of code for, for two developer hours when you could instead get two units of code for two developer hours. Um, and you know, of course the classic rebuttals are all about how, you know, well, if it's a senior junior pairing, then, you know, then the, the, the junior is now learning skills that are going to be useful in the long term. Um, so that's one kind of payback again, you know, an English theory of value approach. Um, there's, you know, if it's, even if it's people who are, who are on the same level, but the quality of code that's produced is, is better, even if it's a, a, a smaller quantity, which is itself, uh, a, a long discussion, um, as to, you know, how much companies really, sh you know, really should value quality versus quantity. And, you know, it, because after all, you know, less, less quality doesn't, you know, it, it, it's, it's, Maybe it's harder to maintain later, but you get more features now. Um, 
you know, usually companies don't value quality enough, which was a whole chapter in the book. Um, but you know, there's there's sort of the the other element that um, that I think is is often missed in that conversation, which is you know think about just the value of two developers conversing about a feature in the in the product. I I can't even say how many times it's, it's happened that I've I've been in a conversation or I've been party to a conversation where you know people were just discussing one of the features and in that discussion emerged some kind of uh, some kind of idea for a new feature or a way to change the feature or to go in a different direction um, realizing that there's going to be some kind of bug uh, the, the the conversation between multiple people about the issue is so incredibly valuable. Um, and that's that's where that ingenuity element comes in because it's it, it, it's basically amplifying uh, the value of the feature. It's it's creating new ideas. It's going far beyond the code that's actually being produced right here and now. Um, and that's that's something I think is off, often lost there. Um, and you know, if we think about again the the English theory of value, um, looking for ways to to maximize the time that we're spending already, rather than looking for ways to add on time. Uh, that's an incredibly, incredibly valuable way of, of spending our time, uh, not just, you know, churning out new stuff or fixing bugs or whatever it is, but uh, sharing understanding and and creating creating new ideas and inspirations that may ultimately have a major impact on how uh, on the direction of the product. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and we can one day we'll have a pair programming discussion <laughs> at length. But I completely agree with everything you said. Um, so tell me a little bit about music and how it uh, corresponds to this uh, Cornell experiment. I know you wanted to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> and and this, this actually this actually relates very well to, to what I was just saying. So I appreciate mm -hmm. you bringing it up now. Um, and you know, it, it also relates to some of the, the other stuff that we we're talking about. And it, this is where the treadmill is going to come in. So uh, So, you know. Pay close attention if that was intriguing to you. Uh, so there, there, there was this really beautiful um, experiment that Cornell did, where they they took two, they, they took a bunch of people, I assume college students, because that's who usually who it is. Uh, I actually, I think it was it was CS students, and uh, they first asked them who likes, you know, who likes having music while you work and who doesn't. So you know, split split the group in half, and then from each half, grab some of them, you know, so that you have basically two groups who are who are fully uh, mixed between the people who like hearing music and the people who don't. They, they then put them into two rooms. Uh, so again, each each group in, in each room was a mixture of people who liked and didn't like music. One of the rooms was completely silent. The other room had you know a selection of music and some headphones. So uh, then they gave them a, a, a task in Fortran to basically take take in a, uh, an input stream of numbers and do a whole bunch of you know arithmetic manipulations to the numbers and then you know have the output. So in terms of speed and accuracy, both rooms did about the same, right? So which you know which kind of makes sense, right? You know the the I can have music going on in the background, and I can be enjoying it with you know more of a of a right brain, and then the left brain is going to be uh, kind of thinking about how I'm going to you know write code, I'm going to convert that spec into code. Uh, but there was a little twist which they didn't tell them about because there's always a twist in these experiments, right? Uh, so. If you put all the operations together and you did the math out, it turns out that the output was exactly the same as the input. And so uh, there were some people who noticed that and some people who didn't. And the vast majority of the people who actually did notice were from the quiet room. So regardless of their inherent preferences for music or no music, um, being in a quiet room helped them have, have that insight-based jump. Um, so basically the the way that i interpreted that experiment and this is just my interpretation is you know if i have a very clear task in front of me i need to get it done like sure turn on spotify uh listen to some music that that you enjoy you know get it done and you know for me the my version of that since i don't do a lot of listening to music although sometimes i i get into into moods where i will for a few days um but my my version has is my treadmill so if i'm uh if i'm Focusing on on coding something out, it's a it's a much clearer task, you know. Because like a lot of tasks are like that, you know. You just kind of you have your your requirements, 
you know, not exactly specification probably, but just, you know, requirements for, for how this is supposed to get done. You, you have a solution in mind. You just need to convert that into code. Uh, so, you know, it's very easy to, to, to move forward on it. And I, I, I do think it helps me to move faster and to stay energized because um, moving around is, is really good for that. Um, and, you know, again, the same thing with music. So for some people, that's, what, that's what's going to get you energized. And that's good, right? Because it's a very straightforward task. But if it's a kind of situation where you're, you're looking for insight-based creative leaps, those aren't going to happen when, uh, when there are distractions. And, uh, you know, and so very often for, for myself, I know that, you know, if I'm in kind of like a standard run-of-the-mill meeting, I'll often have my, my treadmill moving. But if I'm in a one-on-one -on -one with somebody, I'm turning that treadmill off. Uh, if I'm thinking about a complex problem, I'm turning it off uh, because because then I really need to to just be concentrated on the problem at hand and not thinking about anything else with either the left or the right side of my brain. Um, and the same thing presumably would would apply to music. That anytime you're dealing with this uh, more more insight based uh, creative work, where you're um, you know wh where there's a, an opportunity for a breakthrough, that could be lost if you have a lot of those distractions. Yeah, I. <laughs> That's completely true. I really enjoyed uh, reading about this experiment, and I can relate to the treadmill thing. I also have a treadmill desk. It's not set up right now, so I'm not on it. Um, but I have found whenever I'm working on a problem and it becomes hard, I just like step off the treadmill and just let it run underneath me, which is dangerous. Uh, but it's not conscious. It's like my brain says, okay, you have to focus on this. You need to disengage from the walking. Um, and the same thing's true with music, where I sometimes find music helps me to not get distracted, but sometimes I need silence to actually completely like go over what's happening. You know, uh, in my like co-working space I have here, we have like a quiet room, um, and sometimes I'll go in that quiet room to just be quiet. Like I'll go in there, I'll intentionally not bring headphones with me. I just need to sit there and think about what the problem is for a few minutes to really come to any sort of conclusion. I think having the juxtaposition there is really important. Um, and I think that's, that's just a, kind of a novel takeaway, but I think it's something that's worth knowing. And that's the kind of thing that's like, as a you know team member or as a manager, you can share that with your team. That's an like insight you can kind of impart on people, which is like, oh, well, maybe we need to be quiet for this situation. Or maybe we need to really focus on what's happening here. This is a way we can improve ourselves and improve our teams in a, in a subtle way. You know, This is not going to give you 100% productivity back but it is something to worth to consider because i know i've worked in some offices that had like office like music like you could have headphones on if you wanted something else but like every every it just played music over everything and that was like not ideal if you really just needed some, some peace and quiet because you're working on something difficult um so yeah i think that's a a fun a fun bit one thing that I'm I'm thinking about now, and you know, maybe it's it's not <laughs> it's not brilliant, um, but um, but it's sort of occurring to me is you know again back to the the connection between the treadmill and the music, because um, you know it seems like we both have the same experience. Um, there's there's a lot of of interesting um, connection between breathing and thinking. So, music and uh, exercise are both things which can heavily influence the pattern and the pace of your breathing. And if, if you're breathing, you know, like, so the same way that if you, you know, breathe slowly and carefully and kind of a meditative way that can often open up new channels of thinking, uh, it can, it can help lead to a lot of those insight based creative leaps. Um, it could be that when you have something that's, that's dictating that you breathe in a certain way, such as again, exercise where you have to breathe a little faster or music where, especially if it's, if it's, you know, fast or heavy music, you know, very often your heart rate is going to be set by it and your breathing rate is going to be, is going to be much faster. Um, that, that may cut off the, those channels that happen when your breathing is simply dictated by the ebb and flow of the way that you're thinking. Hopefully that wasn't, that wasn't too Eastern for this probably Western audience. Um, no, I but, think that was uh, good. I think there's, there's a lot of science behind that uh, more, more or less. <laughs> I, I think there's more than less. I, I've heard all those things. I mean, you can even find certain uh, songs that supposedly help lower your, your heart rate when you need to relax, you know. Um, under doctor's orders, I've been keeping track of my heart rate the last couple of weeks to make sure it keeps nice and steady. And uh, yeah, I've been, it's been good to see how music affects that and how, you know, things that you're going through can kind of uh, alter that and how that kind of affects the way you approach things. Like for me, 
sometimes silence is what I need to actually get my brain to focus a little bit. Like sometimes I need the silence to like let everything kind of fall away a little bit. Okay, now I can actually just take a few breaths and 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 get to what the next problem is. And kind of as we learn from other books we've read in the past, like you need that me time or that mental space to be able to be empathetic to other people around you. Like if you if you can't do that to yourself, you're not going to be available to do that to other people. Uh, or with other people so it's very important to kind of give yourself that whatever that is to kind of give yourself the time to like you know calm your breathing calm your thought process you know um, and if you didn't know there's something you could do then that might be a problem <laughs> um so what i wanted to talk about here we're kind of running up on time but there's a few one look i want to talk about at the end because it's kind of near and dear to my heart at this moment is um this idea of uh environment so I was reading the chapter about, I think it was chapter eight, that was talking about um, like 10X developers, but also talking about the office environment. Um, and what I found really interesting was they, they had a table that showed the, like, all the questions they asked all these developers about where they work. Uh, and there were some process related things, some management related things, but a lot of them were basically just like, is the environment noisy? Can you escape the noise? Can you have your phone turned off? And the disparity was like super obvious. And now I know this isn't like, the end all be all scientific study for this, but I think it is, it goes a long way to say something that I think a lot of us kind of know a little bit to be true is like good programmers are a product of their environment in so many different ways. Like the way your office is laid out, the way uh, you are treated, all of these things are your environment and they will affect your ability to actually just be good at your job. Um, and look at, let Ariel talk a little bit about this and then I can swing back around with some more thoughts. What, what are your thoughts on uh, how office environment affects uh, a good developer? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, honestly, I think that that uh, the book said it well, which is that you know there there's clearly a correlation, and the causation is not clear. Um, I I was honestly like looking up, you know, can I find a, a good reliable study on, um, you know, on how. Uh, how you know which way the the the, the correlation goes between a you know, quiet calm office environment and productivity um but i think the book also you know kind of had this really this really nice quote uh where where they said well you know it yes it's true that it could be that good people gravitate towards pleasant workspaces or it could be that pleasant workspaces make people more productive um and I'll just I'll just read the quote. Does that really matter to you? In the long run, what difference does it make whether quiet space and privacy help your current people to do better work or help you to attract and keep better people? Um, and, and I thought that was a really a really you know solid observation. Um, you know today the you know unfortunately the quiet workspace thing is not enough of a conversation. But what is really a conversation is remote workers. Uh, and this is a topic near and dear to, to my heart, uh, being a 99% a remote worker. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I've, my, my intuition is that I am less productive and more effective. Um, <laughs> meaning that, that I'm, I'm more likely to get, to get distracted by just stuff that's going on. But I, I'm also like because I don't have all the office politics around me and all the you know people bothering me about this thing and that thing all day. Um, I, I have a little bit more space to just breathe, focus, and and make sure that I'm working on the most important stuff. Um, and you know, would you rather have a more productive worker or a more effective worker? I I mean, I would personally pr prefer the more effective worker who's you know, who's building higher value stuff. Uh, who you know maybe is is I would say like I think of it as like shipping fewer lines of code but the lines of code are higher quality because anyway, more lines of code is not necessarily good. Um, and, uh, you know, bottom line is like, you know, people, people often forget to, to focus on the, on the bottom line, <laughs> right. That, um, that it doesn't really matter what the causation is, you know, whether, whether the demand is justified or not, uh, listen to your developers, listen to your people in general, whatever, honestly, whatever industry it is. Um, because, they'll tell you what they want and very few people are willing to listen to the individual contributors and if you are one of those places that does that will be valued you will have much lower turnover dramatically lower turnover you're going to have um 
the best people come to work for you because they're happy. They're happy, mm-hmm. you know, in your, in your organization. So, um, you know, who really cares whether it's actually helping them to do better if it's, if it's getting you better work and, yeah. and more reliable work because you don't have people quitting every five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Replacing people is very expensive. Um, uh, I, I completely agree. I have never really found myself very productive in, um, open environments, um, it's interesting for me. I would say the majority of my career has been remote, um, but I also don't work very good at home, uh, mostly because I get distracted. Like I work good from coffee shops. Um, so it seems like a weird juxtaposition to be like, oh, I work better around a lot of noise, but I don't work good in open and air environments. <laughs> and I don't know what it is. Um, but that's always been true uh, for me. And now it's very interesting being a business owner. Uh, we're moving into a big office space in the summer um, out of this co-working space and it's, it's huge by comparison. Like this is a little box that we shove ourselves into. Um, we're going to have like half a floor and I'm super excited, but by default, it is a big open room. That's all it is. And I have to pay for the walls. So (laughs) I have to decide how many of those walls are worth it. And so what I've been trying to do is I've been talking to uh, friends of mine who are designers, done some interior design about like, what's a way to increase the privacy and cut down on the noise while also not having to have me pay for, uh, you know, gigantic walls and doors everywhere. Uh, Cause I don't want the cubicle environment, but I don't want like everyone to have their own private office because we do work very collaboratively. We do pair a lot. Um, there's a lot of mentoring going on, but I totally understand like it's not the best environment to have everyone just in the open and just have 20 feet around them at all times. So yeah, stay tuned. We'll have to do a follow up <laughs> in eight months when I'm in the new office to see how the employees feel about it. And you know, as as a business owner now, like I definitely feel like yeah, I don't really matter. It doesn't really matter to me in the long run. I would just make sure that the people I have currently working are happy, and that I continue to attract people who, you know, are good workers because they are happy. You know, in the end, for me, uh, that's what I'm looking for. I want people to be happy to go to the office. Like I don't want people to work from home because they feel like they have to, which the book talks about. Like I think in this like very similar chapter, it's like you shouldn't be working from home because that's the only time you get work done. You know, that's a bad sign. Um, I like people to work from home because I like them to be able to mix up their week. It feels refreshing to be able to say, oh, tomorrow I'll have to sleep in <laughs> and then get work done. You know, not because, oh, I have to work from home tomorrow because I'll never get this done by Friday. Like that tells me there's a problem in the office. And recently, it's been good. It's been because I talk to them too much, so I keep myself busy, and then that doesn't happen to to them. I want to throw in one more quote. Uh, it's not a quote from from this book. It's a quote that this book quoted from a different book. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think it's actually very relevant to what you were just saying about how you know, like, uh, coffee shops are often not a great place to work. Um, so there is this book called uh, A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander uh, that that describes. Uh, he's an architect, and he, he describes a lot of different kind of patterns, ways of uh, not 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 completely specifying what something should be like, but describing the basic elements that that make a uh, a workable space of of all different sorts, you know, all different kinds of things. But the, one of one of the sections of the book, uh, what one of the patterns is uh, pattern number one eighty three is the workplace enclosure, um, and there was something that really jumped out at me as you were speaking that. Uh, I think was really relevant. So he says, you should not be able to hear noises very different from the kind you make from your workplace. Your workplace should be sufficiently enclosed to cut out noises which are a different kind from the ones you make. There is some evidence that one can concentrate on a task better if people around him are doing the same thing, not something else. Uh, and and that's that's maybe getting at you know the 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 coffee shop issue or you know one of the struggles of of people who are remote workers. Uh, who maybe are working in a in a in a home where there are you know children around things like that. Um, that if if the the noise that's around you, if there is noise A and B, the noise is not related to what you're doing. That can be very very distracting. It, it is less distracting when it's related to what you're doing. Um, the problem is that that's probably a very narrow definition. Uh, so if you're you know if you're a developer and you're next door to marketing, that's not going to help you very much. Um, even though it's technically, you know, within the context of the same company, but the stuff they're working on is very is very different from your own stuff. Yeah, I mean, no, I can project like same idea. Yeah, I can relate to that. I think working side by side with people who are 
also on a computer, also typing away, you know, working on code problems. It's like, yeah, I'm also working on code problems. You know, <laughs> like you're, uh, it kind of encourages you to keep working. But when the person next to you is on the phone the entire time, and then the person across from you is having a conversation with someone else next to them, it's easy to get pulled into those conversations, or at least they pull you out. Like I have a problem with focusing in general, and I'm really. Uh, talented at listening to conversations across the room when I don't want to, you know, I'll be at a coffee shop and I'll be like, oh, did you hear about that? Her roommate just moved out. I'm like, who? I'm like, I don't know. Someone way over in the corner. Like, I don't know. I can just pick that out. And it helps to have people working in a like-minded uh, space. And I, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a good point about making sure it's like like-minded as far as like what the conversations are around you. So it's not, you know, as distracting. Um, same to be said about any open space where they have like the kitchen area right at the end. So then you just got like, everything going on. It just kind of bleeds into everything else. It's a disaster. Yeah. Great. Door, doors are kind of a magical thing, you know, and they don't have to be doors that that obscure the visuals of the space, right? Because because you know most people, I would say, are able to deal with visual distractions a little bit better. Uh, although ideally, you're not facing towards the kitchen. Um, but if it's a if it's a noise distraction, then like yeah, forget about it. Um, and, and glass doors can work really well in that context when you want to still have that feel of an open space. Um, you know, glass doors and walls, you know, if you're like, you know, let's say like you want to, you're, you know, that your investors like, you know, are going to want to come in and see like this big open space. Cause that's, that's what they think of as startups, but you actually want to, you know, give people a lot of respect, um, and, and let them have quiet spaces, glass, uh, glass walls and, and doors can be a really good way of doing that. You just have to make sure that they're marked so that people don't bump into them all the time. Uh, that was, that was, that was a different book that we did <laughs> design of everyday things. Yeah. Oh, uh, very good. Did you well, see Apple's uh, thing, by the way, this is campus. This was beautiful. Yeah. That they, um, they, uh, the, they, 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 for those who maybe did not read the articles, right? So they, uh, they created uh, their their new campus has the the entire wall of the of the bottom floor is glass doors, and people can't can't find where the wall is. <laughs> people are just bumping into the wall all day. People put up post-it notes so that you can have a visual marker of where the wall is, um, and uh, and then security took it down because it was messing with the aesthetic of the space. <laughs> Whereas people bumping in, bumping into the wall all day and bleeding out of their faces, <laughs> might be a little worse. We're not, we're not distracting to the to the aesthetic. They were you know, that was okay. Um, so I'm not advocating that. To be clear, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying that it can be a nice way of having uh, you know having noise blocking while still having the feel of an open space. If that's something yeah. that's valuable to your organization. Yeah, agreed. I mean, like in the co working space I'm in now, every office is all glass and it's pretty good. I'm sure the people next to me on both sides know I'm speaking, but from my experience, when they're talking very loud, you just know someone's saying something and it's never disruptive to what you're doing. So these, these glass walls and doors do a really good job of blocking out um, sound because you want to feel like you have privacy when you're in a room with a closed door. If you don't, it's very awkward. It's worse than if it's open because then there's like this weird uh, mismatch, like there's just an incongruity between what you see and what's actually happening. Um, yeah, the uh, the glass the the, gla the one of the glass walls thing is a little rough. Um, there's got to be some middle ground there. Um, that reminds me of the the part in the book they talk about like the office police, you know, uh, making sure the office is exactly the way it's supposed to be. Um, and and that reminds me of that's you know, right. So oh wow, that's that's like a perfect analogy. It is. It is. And we we discussed that briefly when we did our uh, our co our quarterly check in. So before we did this. Uh, call we're on now we had a, a discussion on our on our um i almost said subreddit sorry we had this discussion on our slack team um where we brought up a bunch of questions kind of just to talk about um that were kind of brought up in the first couple of chapters of the book and then we're going to do another one for the second half of the book so if, if you you know are reading along with us you should definitely join it's going to be um, a fun time to kind of chat informally over slack and this was one of the things that got brought up was uh, the idea of like office police who are people who are, you know, policing the way the office should be. And uh, one of the things that I had brought up was a, a friend of mine who was told like they couldn't move, uh, they couldn't like move a book, <laughs> uh, it, not book, they couldn't move a desk. They had these neat organized desks and even though no one used them, they couldn't move theirs to make a standing desk because it would throw off the like appearance of the office as a whole. Um, so his productivity is now suffering as a consequence of maintaining some level of, it, of appearance that's not really important to the productivity or efficacy of him as a developer or even their whole entire team as a developer. I think what ended up happening was the entire dev team moved into a, 
uh, like a conference room. <laughs> they just took over a conference room and said, we can do whatever we want here. So now the entire developer floor is unused of this giant space that they have because they all would have crammed themselves into a conference room to be able to lay it out the way they'd like. Yeah, this is this is sort of sort of gets back to one of the ideas that was brought up in the book, which is just just give you know give people like you know a, figure out like a small group of people who can work in a space and then give them the freedom to control the space. When you actually subdivide this you know this big open environment into a, a, a number of small environments, you sort of remove the aesthetic appeal of them all looking the same. You know, it's like it's it's one thing to you know. To, when you have this this whole big place, like yeah, you want some some aesthetic sense to it, uh, you know, disruptive to productivity though that may be, because um, you know you kind of you just you just want people to walk in and you know and feel good about the at least the look of the place that they're that they're working in. But if you if you actually subdivide it into you know with walls into different working places, um, somehow that just aesthetically that that no longer is a thing it just it just doesn't matter it's like you know if you have a whole neighborhood you know like a like a housing development like who cares how everyone remodels their kitchen you know if you just want all the houses to kind of look nice on the outside and you know relatively similar um it, somehow aesthetically that just that just kind of gets around that problem you know and also gives people the, the ability to massively customize their own space to make it work for them yeah totally agreed um, well, with that, um, I think we can move to part parting thoughts, and then uh, we can we can go from there. So, uh, Ariel, any any? I mean, the book's not over, but any thoughts going into part two? Anything you're looking forward to? Maybe maybe might come up. So I will actually confess my ignorance to to part two. Um, I uh, I was really you know sort of focused on on all the different things to learn and, and explore in, in part one. I honestly didn't even look at what is in part two. Um, but one thing that that really struck me about the book is, you know, on one hand, it's very informal. And some of the jokes, you know, were, were a little too informal, probably for my taste. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, there's, there's an attempt to quantify things uh, that very often, you know, we sort of like take for granted, or it's, you know, it's very opinion based. Um, and they brought up uh, what they described as Gilb's law, which was anything you need to quantify can be measured in some way that is superior to not measuring it at all. And uh, you know, I have my reservations about about Gilb's law mm. because uh, just because it can be measured in some way that is superior to not measuring at all doesn't mean that you're going to measure it in that way. You might measure it in a different way that is worse than not measuring it at all. Um, so it's it's uh, you have to be a little bit careful with it. Um, and of course, you know, measurements influence outcomes the same way that, you know, if you like, if you focus too hard on, you know, KPRs or okay, I don't know, whatever the, the, the letters are for how organizations set goals, like very often that discourages people from trying things that would be better than the things that they've been technically asked to do. Um, so, you know, that very often when you measure something that it becomes that, you know, you're, you're optimizing for that thing in a way that's, that's unhealthy. But, you know, with, with those disclaimers, it's definitely true that, there are a lot of things that you can measure, uh, at least on a on a large scale. If you have a large organization, or if you do a study across multiple organizations, that are actually really valuable. Um, one thing that that I'll, I'll mention as an example of this from from the world uh, is uh, uh, Vaidhi Joshi did a study of uh, code review, mm -hmm. and basically just just sent out this big survey, and it was not perfect, like any survey, right? Um, you know, it it it, it asked questions. Uh, just about people's experiences with code review and the things that they care about and and what they've seen and um and and there were some that that basically turned into a conference talk which you know which which you can look up um I think it's called uh, Goldilocks and the three code reviews or something like that um, but mm -hmm. it, essentially drawing out patterns from the from from the data and yes it's not perfect data and a lot of it was text and so it depends on you know someone to read a text and kind of make subjective decisions about the text, but bottom line, you learn a whole lot from that that's better than, than not measuring it at all. And uh, and it's it's neat to see to see where where that's gone in terms of things like the the impact of or, or at least the correlation between the amount of noise in a workplace environment uh, and and productivity or uh, or insight learning. Um, and and that's that's been very eye-opening for me and I hope to see a lot more of it in part two. Yeah. Um, I kind of I've only I have no real insight into what's going to be in part two other than looking at the end like the contents and reading like what they're going to be um from the first half of the book uh 
I enjoy, I feel like I'm the same boat, boat you are. I enjoy the lightheartedness of some of it. Um, it can be a little bit on too far on one side, but like, I'm like, okay, I can get behind this. It, it makes it feel like a lighter read. I feel like at some level they know this is boring. <laughs> Like and like only certain types of people would find this even remotely interesting. So at least let them try to levy it a little bit. So I'm looking forward to um, some of the stuff in the second half, which, which kind of looks like it's more even more people related. Like it's more like how do you you know do it feels it feels like it might be ca- like culture related, which I'm kind of curious to see how that ends up being. Um, so I'm very excited for our second half. Um, so. One thing I wanted to say before I do a little outro here is that we will go, we're going to do one more of these like Slack uh, informal chats. So uh, keep an eye out for the announcement that'll go up, and uh, we look forward to having everyone come chime in. And you can actually join the Slack channel at any point and just see the previous questions that were asked, and you can kind of read that conversation. So we kind of have a building up a little bit of a community discussion. It's going to kind of live on past just this and the next video about the book, which is kind of exciting uh, to kind of have that environment, that culture or community there. Um, so with that, uh, thanks again for joining us today. Um, you can stay updated about Dev Empathy events by following us on Twitter, at Dev Empathy. Uh, and of course, please don't forget to join us on Slack. You can use the link on our site, devempathybook.club. Um, and we're looking forward to interacting with you and growing even further as a community um, so we become better developers and better people. All right. Bye.